Kerf and Triple Three Lima Delta Four PS Ground Taxi via Bravo Echo Hold Short, only one four. Caravan 333, Lima Delta, 4 Pierce Tower. I've got a serious situation here about pilot and John. I have no idea how to fly the airplane. American 1845, you can make the left turn there, hold short of 10 left. It's going to be a couple minutes. Uh, you just witnessed a couple passengers land that plane. Man, they did a great job. Did you say the passengers landed the airplane? That's correct. Oh my God! Yeah, no. no, great job. No flying experience. We got a controller that worked them down. That's a flight instructor. It's Tuesday, May tenth, twenty twenty-two. Darren Harrison, thirty-nine, from Lakeland, Florida, had spent the last five days in the Bahamas participating in a fishing tournament. Darren and others in his group arrived in the Bahamas on the previous Thursday by means of a private charter flight. The charter aircraft, a 2015 model Cessna 208 Caravan, is owned by the friend of Darren Harrison who invited him to the Bahamas Fishing Tournament. The Cessna Caravan is a rugged single-engine aircraft with a powerful turboprop engine and seating for up to nine passengers. This particular caravan had been fitted with floats for water landings up until two weeks prior to this incident. Commercial pilot Ken Allen, 64, of Lake Wells, Florida, has been hired to fly the caravan on this trip. The plane that we were flying is a, a friend of mine uh, who bought this plane who's not qualified for it. So um, he uh, just hired me to fly it. Today, Ken's job is to fly the caravan to Marsh Harbor to pick up Darren Harrison, who needs to return to Florida and get back to his business. Along, just for the ride, was pilot Ken's longtime friend, 69-year-old Russell Russ Frank, and I'm nationally known as the other passenger. That day, uh, May 10th, I was really just along for the ride. What a ride. <laughs> Ken and Russ departed Lake Wells Tuesday morning at 8.15 a.m., headed for Marsh Harbor. Palm Beach Perch, good morning, Caravan. Triple Three, Lima Delta is with you. At 5,000, we have Zulu at Fort Pierce. Triple Three, Lima Delta, Palm Beach Perch, expect our land one right. I expect uh, one zero right. Triple Three, Lima Delta. Bye. Fort Pierce Tower, Caravan Triple Three, Lima Delta is on the visual, one zero right. Caravan Three, Lima Delta, number three, following the Cessna. He's on about a mile and a half off that final now, runway one zero right, stay to land. All right, uh, number three, one zero right, clear to land. Triple three, Lima Delta, looking for Trevor. After a brief stop in Fort Pierce, Florida, to obtain the required customs paperwork, Ken took off from Fort Pierce at 9:12 a.m. for the 190 nautical mile flight to Marsh Harbor. Grand three, Lima Delta, flight heading one zero zero, runway one zero right, clear for immediate takeoff. Check is a mile final. All right, uh, traffic is back clear for immediate takeoff. One zero right, one zero zero on the heading. Triple three, Lima Delta. Caravan 3, Lima Delta, contact Palm Beach departure on 123.62, good day. On 23.62, good day, Triple 3, Lima Delta. 333, Lima Delta, Palm Beach departure, rate of contact, Palm Beach is 5,000. 3, Lima Delta, contact Palm Beach center on 132.25, 132 in the quarter. 132.25, Triple 3, Lima Delta. After a one hour and seven minute uneventful flight, Ken lands the caravan in Marsh Harbor. Flight aware data shows the caravan remained on the ground in Marsh Harbor for a total of 39 minutes. Having picked up Darren Harrison for the return trip, Ken filed an IFR flight plan back to Fort Pierce. An IFR, or Instrument Flight Rules flight plan, requires the pilot to maintain constant communications with air traffic control throughout the entire flight. Ken taxied the caravan onto runway 09 and departed Marsh Harbor at 10.58 a.m.
take off and climb to the filed cruise altitude of 12,000 feet appeared to be completely normal. Ken's friend Russ was seated in the co-pilot seat. Darren was seated near the rear of the caravan where he could stretch out and relax for the estimated one hour and 15 minute flight back to the Florida mainland. After being away from home for five days, Darren was looking forward to seeing his wife, Brittany, who at the time was seven months pregnant with their first child, a baby girl. As is common practice in smaller aircraft with high cabin noise levels, all three of the caravan's occupants were wearing noise-canceling type aviation headsets to make communications easier. The pilot can communicate with air traffic control with a simple push of a button and also talk with the passengers using the caravan's intercom mode. For the first hour of the trip, the caravan proceeded along its assigned route normally. As required for all pilots entering U.S. airspace, Ken remains in constant contact with air traffic controllers. Like any good pilot and a standard practice to stay ahead of the airplane, Ken would have already pre-tuned his two radios with all the proper ATC air traffic control frequencies he would need for the arrival back into Fort Pierce. Having all these frequencies preset simplifies switching ATC frequencies by only a single button push during the busy arrival phase of the flight. As he neared the U.S. coastline, Ken would have been talking to Miami Center en route controllers. Caravan 3 Lima Delta, descend and maintain 1 0 10,000. Down to 10,000, 3 Lima Delta. Ken sets the caravan's autopilot to descend at 800 feet per minute to the new assigned altitude. After leveling off at 10,000, the caravan cruises normally for the next five minutes. At about 10.57 a.m. Guys, I gotta tell you, I, I'm not feeling well. What does that mean? I, I've got a really bad headache and I'm fuzzy. I just don't feel right. What's wrong? What do we need to do? Ken does not respond again. Darren throws off his headset and begins moving forward. He remembers thinking, I can't die today. I've got a baby on the way, not today. When Darren reaches the unconscious pilot, all he can see out of the windshield is the blue water of the Atlantic Ocean rushing toward him. In a steep dive and right bank, the caravan is accelerating toward the ocean, reaching a speed of 260 knots, well over the 175 knot maximum operating speed. The caravan is diving toward the ocean, losing 6,500 feet of altitude per minute. Even if the wings aren't ripped off first, the caravan will slam into the water in less than a minute. Darren doesn't have time to remove Ken from his seat, so from behind the pilot seat, he reaches around Ken and takes hold of the control yoke. Fortunately, Darren doesn't panic. Calmly and instinctively, Darren begins pulling back on the yoke to stop the dive. He knows he shouldn't pull too fast at this high rate of speed. By the time Darren gets the nose of the caravan pitched back up to stop the dive, they have lost 3,500 feet in altitude in the 30 to 40 seconds it took to regain control. Darren was, was so quick to get up there and, and uh, figured that he had to get Ken out of the uh, pilot seat. He's a big guy, and, and he didn't have, as far as I could tell, much problem getting Ken to the back. He climbs into the now empty pilot seat and grabs the headset Ken was wearing. When he puts it on, he can't hear anything. He realizes it has disconnected from the instrument panel. He pulls the wire until, to his surprise, he finds only frayed wire where the plugs used to be. He knows he is gonna have to talk to somebody on the radio, but it can't happen with this headset. He looks at Russ and says, I'm gonna need your headset. Darren had asked me for my headset. Well, when you have a headset on, it's noise canceling. So I wouldn't have heard him came up with another set and got those on and we fixed him up. He showed me the plug and, and I found where the receptacle was and I plugged it in. And he had the mic up on top of his head and I moved it down to his mouth. I showed him where the push to talk button was and then it was his show. 
finally, Darren can hear Russ on the headset, and more importantly, he can talk to ATC. Darren now has a chance to look at the instrument panel, and he sees another problem. The caravan is equipped with a Garmin G1000 avionics suite. The panel consists of three large glass panel displays. The panel directly in front of Darren is the pilot's primary flight display, or PFD. The larger center panel is the multifunction display, or MFD. The MFD and the co-pilot's PFD have both gone dark. This means the Garmin's moving map that shows the aircraft's location is gone. Also gone is the number two radio, which Ken had been using to communicate with Miami Center air traffic controllers. The preset frequency for Fort Pierce Tower and the number one radio is now Darren's lifeline to get help. Unbeknownst to Darren and Russ, the Miami Center controller has been trying to contact the caravan when he noticed it was deviating from its flight plan. Unable to make contact, the center controller declares Caravan 333 Lima Delta Nordo, or no radio. Since all aircraft approaching the United States ADIZ, Air Defense Identification Zone, must remain in contact with ATC at all times, a Nordo alert is sent to the Department of Defense, which causes two fighter jets based at Homestead Air Base to be scrambled to investigate. Caravan 333, Lima Delta, Fort Pierce Tower. I've got a serious situation here. My pilot has gone into here. I have no idea how to fly the airplane, but I'm in the 9100. 333, Lima Delta, Roger. What's your position? I have no idea. I can see the coast of Florida in front of me, and I have no idea. Number 333, Lima Delta, do you know how to uh, operate the transponder? Can you squawk 7700? Uh, uh, Repeat that frequency to stop. Number 333 Lima Delta, fable input 7700 into your transponder. 7700, yes. November uh, 3, Lima Delta, can you uh, say again what the uh, situation is? Pilot, is it here? Number 3, Lima Delta, I came in a little broken. Uh, what, what was the situation with the pilot? He is incoherent, he is out. Number 3, Lima Delta, Roger, uh, try to hold the wings level and see if you can start uh, descending for me. Uh, push forward on the uh, controls and uh, descend at a very slow rate. Yeah, I'm just sitting right now at 550 feet a minute, passing 8640. Number 33, Lima Delta, Roger, and uh, continue the descent and uh, try to level off at 5,000 feet. And for what heading do I need to be at? Give me a compass heading, because I have no controls. All my electronics went when we went in the roll. Remember, 3 Lima Delta, maintain wings level and uh, just try to follow the coast, either north or southbound. We're trying to locate you. 10 4, uh, passing 8600. Number three, Lima Delta, Fable, uh, hit the ident button on the uh, transponder. Which one is it? Number three, Lima Delta, on the transponder, if there's a button that says ident, hit the uh, ident button for me. I, I what? Ident, I, I, N, B, E, N, T. I'm looking for it, I can't find it. Number uh, three, Lima Delta, if able, uh, I have a frequency for you to put into your radio. It's 132.15132.15. That's Palm Beach approach. They may have a better idea of uh, where you're at. November three, Lima Delta, did you copy the frequency 132.15? No. Number three, Lima Delta, no problem. Just uh, c continue to stay wing wings level, maintain 5,000, and uh, follow the coast, and we're going to try to find you here on the radar. Okay, good boy. 
you guys located me yet? I can't even get my NAS printer to turn on it. It has all the uh, information on it. You guys got any ideas on that? Palm Beach Approach is briefed by Fort Pierce Tower of the situation with the Nordo Caravan 333 Lima Delta. Palm Beach Air Traffic Controller Robert Bobby Morgan is on break in the Palm Beach Tower facility when he hears an unusual page. Bobby, come to the Tracon immediately. Bobby, come to the Tracon immediately. The Tracon, or radar room, is a windowless room located in the tower structure on a floor below the tower cap. Robert is not only a level 9 tower and TRACON controller, but more importantly, he is a pilot and a CFI certified flight instructor. Robert has no idea why he's being paged, and he wonders if someone is playing a practical joke. He heads to the TRACON. Meanwhile, Palm Beach Approach located Caravan 333 Lima Delta on radar about 30 miles east of Boca Raton. Since Darren does not know how to change radio frequencies, the controllers in the Palm Beach Tracon at Palm Beach activate a Motorola PET 2000 emergency radio that allows them to manually tune in the Fort Pierce Tower frequency. Using an old school handheld mic, they attempt to contact Caravan 333 Lima Delta. Are you able to read your heading from the instrument now? I know it on the uh, nose. It, it looks a little bit to the, um, what was it, south, uh, southwest. Okay, and three Lima Delta, do you have any experience flying an airplane? No. I've flown as a passenger but I have no idea how to stop an airplane. I don't know what to do with the flaps. Uh, I don't I don't know how to control my speed. I could, um, uh, what, uh, what altitude do you want me at? Three of them about to, for now, descend and maintain 3,000, and you can just stay on the heading you're currently flying. We have another controller who is a flight instructor and he's going to help you maneuver the airplane. Okay. Caravan 333 Lima Delta has an unconscious pilot. There are two passengers flying the aircraft. Since you're a flight instructor and the most current among us, we're going to have you talk him down to land on one of the runways. Any runway will do. We're counting on you. Robert's first thought to himself is, oh man, why me? When Robert sits down at the scope, he can see Darren is flying the plane. He has it under control. Sir, 333 Lima Delta, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, for now, just continue your descent uh, no lower than 2,000. We're going to try to get you to an airport. All right. I can see, I can see the shoreline. I think we're going to take you to Boca. Let me know if you see it. It's off your 10 o'clock and 4 miles. Uh, on my, I mean, um, okay, sir, it's off to your left coming up. I think I might have it in sight. Caravan 3 Lima Delta, change your plan. We're going to bring you to Palm Beach instead. It has a bigger runway, and it's a 10,000-foot runway. You'll have a better chance. Okay, good idea. What a 
want you to do is to start a shallow turn to fly heading 360. Um, I mean, um, I want you to keep the shoreline off your right and point the aircraft north. I'll point out the airport as you get closer. I have no idea how to stop the plane. I, I don't know how to use the brakes. And do you know how to turn the screens back on? All I can see now is the altitude. Three Lima Delta, don't worry about that. I can pretty much see your heading and I've got your altitude. Are you able to see your airspeed? No, uh, um, all I have is altitude. Wait, you, you've got airspeed right, right there. Uh, wait, yeah, I can see the airspeed. It's about 140. Three Lima Delta, that's good. That's close to what I'm showing for your uh, ground speed. Robert has never flown a Cessna caravan before. The operations supervisor requested two printouts of the typical caravan instrument panels. One was the analog or steam gauge version and the other was the Garmin G1000 version. Robert was able to reference these printouts to familiarize himself with the location of the caravan's major controls. Delta, it looks like you're doing a good job holding your heading and descending the airplane, just easy and gentle on the controls. Okay. Three Lima Delta, you're going to see Palm Beach Airport. Um, it will be coming up on your right, but we're not going to go there yet. I'm going to bring you across the final and give you more time to get set up and slow down. Do you see the airport? Um, yes. We think we can see the airport. Three Lima Delta, I want you to start reducing power just a small amount at a time, slowing up. You see the largest lever on the console with a black handle. Okay, yeah, I see the throttle. Okay, Three Lima Delta, just pull that throttle back toward you about a half an inch at a time, just a small amount, and we'll keep an eye on your speed. Remember, airspeed is your friend, so we don't want to get you too slow. Keep an eye on the airspeed. I don't want you to get any slower than 110 knots. Three Lima Delta, I want you to go ahead and start a shallow turn to the left. I'm going to start working you around for the runway. All right, slight left turn and, um, hey, what about the flaps? Do we need those? Three Lima Delta, we can try flaps. You can use the flap lever on the far right of the center console. Just put it down in the first notch, but be prepared. The nose is going to balloon up as the flaps come down. You can use the large trim wheel on the far left of the center console to trim the nose back down. You can relieve the pressure on the yoke by rolling the trim wheel forward away from you. Uh, yeah. The plane is flying kind of weird. Can we not do flaps? Three Lima Delta, that's fine. We don't need them. Just uh, raise them back up. Three Lima Delta, your altitude is getting a little low. Try to maintain 2,000 feet. If you need to use the trim wheel to hold, ease that uh, nose up a little bit, just roll it back towards you a little bit up at a time. That should help uh, relieve some of the yoke forces. Okay, I'm working on it. Delta, I'm going to start turning you back in toward the airport. I want you to start a shallow turn to the left. I want you to just keep the airplane in a gentle left turn all the way back around to the east and we'll start getting you lined up with the runway. Just try to hold that 2,000 foot altitude. Okay, I'm turning to the left. Just let me know when to stop. Okay, how do I stop? I mean, uh... How do the brakes work? Three Lima Delta, you apply the brakes by pushing in on the top of the rotor pedals. All I want you to do when you get on the runway is to put light, even pressure on the top of the rudder pedals. Just use gentle pressure on the rudder pedals to keep the aircraft near the center line of the runway. You can start to level your wings. You're about eight miles from the runway. 
you can start a slow, gradual descent. You've got plenty of time, nice and easy on the descent. And I appreciate it. Uh, everybody's patience here. Just hang with me. It's going to be a couple minutes. Tower for 21, holding short 10 left. I'll be standing by for landing. Top 21, Roger aircraft about 7 miles northwest now. Looks like they're getting some flight controls before they come in. Very good, thank you. Three Lima Delta here, 7 miles out. The runway is going to look small and narrow. As you get closer, it's going to keep getting a lot wider. When you get close to the ground, the runway is wide in the windscreen. I want you to shift your eyes to the far end of the runway to judge your height. That's when you can start bringing your throttle back slowly and then start to pull the yoke back towards you a little at a time to slow your descent and get the landing. Okay, I'm pretty sure I've got the runway in sight and um, it looks like there's a highway heading straight for the airport off my right wing. Three Lima Delta, that's right. Palm Beach is straight ahead. Your heading looks good. Your altitude and descent rate look good. Three Lima Delta, you're looking great. Your speed looks good. You're five miles out. Just try to keep the end of the runway at the same place in the windshield. If the runway starts moving down, just ease the nose down a little to increase that descent. If the runway starts moving up in the windshield, just ease the yoke back a little to slow the descent. Delta, your speed is good, around 130. You're at 1,200 feet, four miles from the runway. Three Lima Delta, does the aircraft have floats or on wheels? We're on wheels. Remember, the caravan's floats had been removed about two weeks prior to this incident. Top 21, uh, landing aircraft on about a mile and a half final caravan. As the caravan nears the runway and descends below 300 feet, Robert loses radar contact. The data block he had relied on to assist Darren is gone. Robert thinks, oh great, and he wonders, am I still talking to him? Three Lima Delta, are you still there? I'm still here. Okay, Three Lima Delta, just remember as you get closer and the runway gets wider, start pulling your power back slowly and pull the yoke back toward you to land. Delta, just to use the toes on the top of the rudder pedals and apply even pressure on both pedals until the plane stops. American 1845, you can make the left turn there, hold short of one zero left. It's going to be a couple minutes. Uh, you just witnessed a couple passengers land that plane. Not a problem. Uh, go ahead and uh, continue. We'll hold short one zero left, American 1845. Man, they did a great job. Did you say the passengers landed the airplane? That's correct. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. No, great job. No flying experience. We got a controller that works them down. That's a flight instructor. Hey, I'm feeling pretty comfortable with this. Do you want me to turn off on a taxiway to get to the runway? Three Lima Delta, no, you're, you're fine. Just stop the airplane and the fire department is coming to you. Uh, how do I cut it off now? Um, stand by. Three Lima Delta, just pull all the levers on the center console back towards you. Got it. Thank you very much. Through the Delta, you're welcome. Great work. Darren and Russ throw off their headsets and jump out of the airplane as the first responders rush to the caravan. Darren takes a moment to say the biggest prayer of his life. It was a thankful prayer 
for the safety and everything that had happened, but the last part of the prayer and the strongest part was for the guy in the back. I knew it was not a good situation. When they took him to the hospital, he was not expected to live. Once we landed, I recall waking up a little bit, but I was still confused. And I was thinking someone was trying to pull me out of the plane or throw me out of the plane. I remember telling them I just needed to get back to the front seat. Um, I now know it was these guys trying to get me out of the plane. I had a death grip on the door, I think. So <laughs> I didn't want to get out of that plane. <laughs> you know, as an ER doctor, sometimes you just have to be a little blunt. You know, I, I told Mr. Allen, I said, you know, you're not having a stroke. You're actually having an aortic dissection, and it's so much worse. Um, and I'm sorry, but this is what we're going to do. This is the plan. And I wasn't sure that he was going to be able to see his wife ever again. So, you know, we, I put her on FaceTime so they could see each other. And thank God that wasn't the last time that you guys have seen each other. It was a type A aortic dissection, which is a tear of the... Uh, the layers of the aorta. His surgery was a long one. It was, uh, I think, just around nine hours. To me, to me, doing our job that we're trained to do is really not heroic. I think the folks in the story that were met with unforeseen, you know, circumstances that they were not prepared for and were forced to act in a way that they were not trained, uh, uh, you know, to do, that's really heroic. To land a plane, you know, with the assistance of, you know, folks in the tower. Hello, um, my name is Robert Morgan. I was the air traffic controller that uh, helped these guys. Um, I was just doing my job. I would have, you know, done anything I could to make a successful outcome. And uh, it feels good to help somebody. And this is all like over the top for me. I never expected any of this. I just thought we'd kind of go back to uh, everyday working, and it's really blown up to be a, a good story. Um, so, great job. Thanks for still being with us. <laughs> and thank you. Why was I selected for this? Just in my vein, like, oh no. <laughs> but I guess I gotta step up to the plate and make it happen. So uh, the emergency radio is something that we have in our facility. They're, they're commonly above us in our radar room. Um, so when I was paged to come to the radar room to help, basically um, they were on the frequency of Fort Pierce Tower. So it's kind of like just a push to talk radio. So they were already on that frequency. Um, and when Fort Pierce Tower lost radio communications with uh, Darren, we were able to reach them on that same frequency as they flew closer to Boca Raton. So um, my supervisor was able to make contact with Darren. And then when I was paged in the room, that radio was already ready to go. But it's something that we usually keep off and we turn on only in emergency. And the only reason we had to use that is because they didn't know how to change the radio frequency to the frequencies we would normally use. Stuff. None of my audio, to the best of my knowledge, has been released to the media because it's, it can't, it, it's not there unless somebody somehow recorded it because it was done on this emergency radio. Fort Pierce Tower just looks at like a five mile radius and my facility, Palm Beach Approach Control Tower, we look at like a 90 mile, 90 miles north and south and about 60 mile radius um, within the Palm Beach County area. So when the plane landed at PVIA, um, so I, I could never see the plane, you know, out the window because our radar room is just all dark, no windows, nothing. We do have people in the tower um, that were watching the whole thing, but they couldn't get on the same frequency to assist. Um, so I lost uh, the plane around 300 feet on our radar, but your heart kind of sinks because I don't know if they're still there. I don't know if they crashed. So I reach out to Darren. I say, hey, are you still there? He's like, I'm still here. I said, okay, and I just reminded him you know, what the runway is going to look like as it gets closer and what to do with the power and start to pull back. And then about five or 10 seconds go by and he says, I'm on the runway. How do I stop this thing? So just, uh, I just like, look, he's like, he made it. I look at my, and I was like, he made it just, uh, just kind of like a, I think it was adrenaline, but it's just like a wave of emotion and just kind of weight comes off your shoulders. Cause you, you feel like, you know, you're called to that room that you're the only one they can count on. And if you fail, 
that's going to be bad. It's going to, you know, I don't want that on me either. So I'm, I'm trying to do the best thing I can to help them. Um, but it was just a, a great feeling um, to help them and kind of like wake me up from this dream. It can't be real, that type of feeling. Um, and everybody's just like yelling in the room, you're the hero, you did it. And they're just coming right and shaking you. Um, but it was just a lot of emotion. I didn't cry, but like before, I just, you kind of get tears and, you know, to your eyes. Um, but it feels really good. And, and still can't believe that we pulled it off and, you know, you didn't crash. You didn't even damage the plane as far as I could tell. And a couple days later, I went up to the plane to make friends with it. I hugged it and took some pictures with it. I had a bad feeling if I was going to bring him to Boca Raton just because of it's a very congested area and a smaller runway. I just kept talking to him the whole time because I, I feel like that at least keep him calm, like letting him know that, hey, someone's here for you. Just always keep talking to him, just making sure everything's okay. Now, I, I, I fly as Ken's co-pilot. I don't know anything about flying, but that's where I like to sit. So <laughs> Ken was, uh, he was still moving and he was breathing and I knew he was still alive. And when he laid down, his feet were by my hand and I just kept tapping his feet. I don't know why. Uh, I just wanted to make sure he was still with us. He had such a calm, collected, and I'm thinking, well, maybe this, maybe this young guy has some gaming experience or flight simulator, you know. But I had to make a hard decision that, that Darren was going to be our best chance, and I may, I'm glad I made that decision. I, I just learned this from Darren's interviews that he was actually, actually practicing on the way in. He was getting the feel for the plane. It seems absurd to say this, but it felt like a normal landing. We did come in just a little bit fast, but uh, uh, he hit the brakes pretty good. So then, then he had the wherewithal to, to ask him if they, if he wanted them to move the plane out of the runway. And I'm thinking, no, just shot the plane off and let's get off. <laughs> so most patients with this diagnosis unfortunately won't make it uh, to the hospital, and the overwhelming majority of patients will pass away without any any surgical treatment, prompt surgical treatment. The uh, prognosis with surgery has really improved quite dramatically. When it was over, I was like, I had texted my wife. I went for a walk out in the parking lot, and I just said, I, uh, you know, that's probably when it sank in when I texted her, and I just said, hey, I think I just pulled off the impossible. She texts back, what do you mean? I said, well, I just think I just, I just saved someone's life. Uh, the first thing I said to Darren when I talked to him, I'm sorry. <laughs> For putting, for putting you, uh, your life at danger. And I told Russ the same thing. Because I've got some guilt for that. I just want to thank everybody. And I'm very happy to be here. So thank you very much. About an hour and a half after landing the caravan, Darren was given a tour of the Palm Beach Tower facility and was able to meet the team of controllers that worked to get him down safe. Robert asked Darren if there was anything about this incident that made him want to become a pilot. Darren's reply, no. Airman 333, Lima Delta, Fort Pierce Tower, slow it down.